Great to see you all this morning. How's everyone doing? Enjoying the warm weather? All the guys are happy now they've got some chocolate. So um, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to take you back three years. Do you remember what, three years ago? 2020? Okay, very briefly, okay, very briefly. But um, I try not to remember it too much, but I have some vague memory of endless Zoom calls, daily walks around the park. Do you remember that daily exercise? Homeschooling. And, and then it all just gets a little bit hazy. Um, one, one thing that was meant to be a highlight for us was a family holiday that summer. And I think you're going to see a little um, picture from, from Dorset, beautiful seas, lovely scenery. We had some great time together as a family. But then one day we were out for a walk. And if you click on to the next slide, Steve. Uh, here we go, back. Oh, back, that's preempting. Just go back a little bit. So we were, I was walking down this, the, down this steep hill when I stopped rather quickly. I rolled my ankle. And I knew immediately that it was pretty bad. I had to walk a mile back to the car and everything. But I had absolutely no idea in that moment that I'd still be dealing with the aftermath of that moment three years on. So for me personally, it was a day where things really changed a lot in my life. I had, had sort of all sorts of physio, surgery. I've now got a chronic pain condition in my ankle, which I, you know, so many people have prayed for, but it's still, it's still there, you know? Um, plenty of time in hospital, and even effectively having to learn to walk again. Um, I didn't drive for 18 months, and if I'm honest, I barely left the house other than Sundays. You need to see me walking around in my crutches or trying to walk around. Um, and, you know, even though I've been prayed for more times than I can remember, um, despite some huge, you know, improvement, three years on, I am still suffering. You know, I've got constant pain in my ankle. Um, I still can't move it properly. Um, and some days walking is still a real challenge. And for us, it's, it's mirrored a bunch of things that's gone on in the life of our family, um, even harder things than that, um, that we've had to face. And it's been a really tough run for us these last few years. And I, and I know that as I stand here, I'm not the only one that is suffering from different things in our lives. You know, life gets tough sometimes, doesn't it? Maybe you've suffered or are still suffering from the, all those impacts of COVID and lockdown, and, um, and maybe you lost a job. Maybe you're struggling now with the rising costs in so many areas. There's mental health challenges. So many of us are struggling. Difficult relationships, life-changing disability or illness, or even the loss of loved ones. But what if, in the midst of all of that, we had a better story to tell? What if, despite all the challenges we might face in our life, what if we could write a different story and invite people into that story? I read somewhere that, and I can't remember where I saw this, but it, um, it, it, it said, the darker the world gets, the brighter the gospel shines. The darker the world gets, the darker our lives can get sometimes, the brighter the gospel shines within that. The gospel, the good news of Jesus. Jesus, the one who came to give life and life to the full. You know, as followers of Jesus, we have hope beyond any situation that we face. And we have a God who knows our pain and walks with us in our pain. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not yet following Jesus, first, you are so, so welcome. But that is the hope that you are invited into today. This morning, we're continuing our series, Where the Wind Blows, thinking particularly about how we encounter God's life, regardless of what we're going through. We, we're going to read from the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, chapter 37, in just a moment. Now, Ezekiel, just let me tell you a little bit about him. He was a prophet, and he was a preacher. And his book it ha paints this picture of both judgment and salvation. And in the chapter before the one we're going to read, in chapter 36, he talks about a hope that is to come. And then in chapter 37, the one, what we're reading today, he paints a picture of what this promise of hope looks like. So I'm just going to pray very quickly for us, and then we're going to read this passage together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that you, it speaks to us today. And I pray that whatever I share, that you would speak to us today. Take away anything of me and just, you know, that you would become greater and I would become less in this, Lord. So Lord, we lift you up this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
So if you have a Bible or a device, you know, look it up. The words are going to come up behind me, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to read starting from the first verse. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of, the, of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, um, of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, and he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open, up your, open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. And so Ezekiel carries on sharing this prophetic vision of life coming, of the two nations of Judah and Israel coming together. And he lands with these two beautiful verses at the end of this, this chapter. He says, my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. I love that. So Ezekiel's dream here, dry bones here, representing God's people, dead and scattered. But as Ezekiel is obedient to the Lord, he speaks life to these dry bones, and the dry bones respond. Life comes, hope stirs, God is at work. You know, when we look at the world around us, when we experience struggles of our own, it can feel like there are plenty of dry bones around. There's a guy called Ed Stetzer. He's a theologian, professor, basically a very smart guy. He talks about six pandemics that we are facing right now. And they all begin with the letter D, so he's also a better preacher than I am as well. So he talks about six things. The first one is disease. COVID has left its mark, hasn't it? Think about mental health, all of those kind of things. So much going on. Distrust, distrust in culture. You know, no one trusts anymore these days in the way that they used to, and that includes Christians. The damage of technology. Just pick up this. Apparently, the average person will pick up their phone 2,617 times a day. That's the average. So the top, apparently, some people will pick it up 5,400 times. If that's you, you know, don't you? But a disorientation in identity. The world is confused and confusing. So many are struggling to know that who they are, who they've created to be is enough. Disruption to mental health. We have a crisis going on and our systems are creaking. And finally, there's division in the church. There's so much of this going on and it, it's just heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. So these, are, these really are some of the dry bones that we see in the world around us. And each of us in some way are impacted by these. Yeah, as I said at the beginning, we have a better story to tell. As Annabeth was sharing earlier, we are ambassadors. We get to tell a different story to our friends, our family, our colleagues, our neighbors, our fellow school parents, whatever it is. We have a story of hope, a story of life, and a story of salvation. But to tell that story, we need to deal with what we face in our own lives. So 
I, I want to share some things this, this morning that I found really helpful in those difficult moments in my life. And, and I hope that wherever we're at, whether we're in a place where we feel like we're doing great or we're not doing so great, that these things will really help us. So I want to ask the question, what do, what do we do when life throws us dry bones? So the first thing I'd say is stay connected. Connected with Jesus and connected with others. The passage outlines three ways that we can connect to the Lord. Verse 3 says, you alone know. You know, life is uncertain. This world that we live in is uncertain, but we can put our hope and our trust in the one who knows it all, who already knows every circumstance we face. And we stay connected with Jesus through his word and through his presence. Verse 4 tells us to, to hear the word of the Lord. So each day, let's open up scripture. Let's make it a really good habit in our lives. And then following on, verses 8 to 9 and 14 talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We invite Holy Spirit to come as we gather, but we also carry his presence wherever we go. So we invite him into all the places that we go during the week. So we stay connected with Jesus, but we also need to stay connected with others. I realize that I'm quite privileged. I work in a place, i.e. here, where you'll be pleased to know that people actually care about one another. I appreciate that. So in the midst of my pain, there were people that would pop around and take me out. People that in those moments where I was really struggling would make sure that I actually get to leave the house or have a coffee with me or something like that. But equally, there were also times when I'd enter into cycles of depression where the last thing I wanted to do was see anybody. I don't know if you've ever been in this kind of situation, but I would ignore messages. You know, I wouldn't let those blue ticks go up on, on WhatsApp. I would ignore phone calls sometimes. You know, each one of us needs people in our lives who will notice when we're not reading messages, who will notice when we're not picking up the phone, notice when we're not acting as ourselves, notice when we're not around. So who in our lives are going to reach out to us? And in turn, who can we be the ones to reach out to? I love how verse 10 talks about a vast army. An army is made up of individuals who look out for one another. We need good relationships like that. We need communities of support, people willing to fight for us when we don't always have the, the will and the strength to fight for ourselves. That's why at Riverside, small groups and tri groups are so important. A small group is, is simply just a group of people that share life together, pray together, worship together, look at the Bible together, share communion with one another. If you're in one, that's so good, so great. If you're not one, I just, in one right now, I just want to encourage you. You can find a group that works for you across the week, all sorts of different times and, and, and everything. There are groups on, um, available online, so you can go and look at the small groups page on the website, or you can chat to someone at the Connect area at the end of the service. And we always need more groups, right? So we always want to create groups for everyone to be a part of one. And so if you want to find out more about what it takes to, to lead a small group, I'm doing some small group leaders training in a few weeks' time online. Jump on a call with me and we can chat some more. I'd love you to join me for that. You can sign up uh, through the details there. So when life throws us a bone, we stay connected, but we also need to give ourselves time to take a breath. The passage talks of God's breath breathing life into these dry bones, and each of us need time to breathe. Every breath we have is a gift, and as we breathe in, we invite Holy Spirit to fill us. Why don't you, just as we're sat here, just, just take a breath in, hold it, thank the Lord for the breath that he's given you, and then let it out slowly. Just, can you just feel that tension going out of your body and feel Holy Spirit coming in and filling you? Deep, slow breaths help us to operate at a different pace. And if we're not sold by that, Jesus knew the importance of slowing down. 
Have you noticed in the Gospels the amount of times he would take himself off to quiet places, to be by himself, to pray with his Father? And I always think, if something was good enough for Jesus, it's got to be good enough for us, right? So if we're struggling to operate at a good pace, Jesus, in the midst of everyone coming at him, found places and times to slow down and to be with his Father. And I'll be honest, I've learned that the hard way throughout life. And I think especially for me in these last three years, I, I need to build moments of rest. And for me, that used to be doing something really physical. So after perhaps a week of meetings, connecting with people, writing sermons, and all the other stuff that pastors get involved in, I would take my Friday and I'd jump on my bike and I would just do laps around Richmond Park or go out into the hills or something like that. But I haven't been able to jump on my bike for three years. So I've had to find different ways to be able to connect with the Lord. Because what I would do would clear my head, but I'd also just have these moments out in the middle of nowhere, just me and the Lord. And I used to, it was just be so helpful. So I found I've had to kind of engage in, in movies, books, music. I walk when I'm able. But actually sitting in the garden when you can is like my new cycling. I'm really rock and roll. So that's as good as it gets right now. But, you know, we have to find ways that we can slow down and operate at a pace and to have good rest and good rhythms in our life. We need to find ways that allow us to go at his pace, not our own, to breathe in his presence. So that might mean going out into nature That might mean worshipping in song or creativity. Maybe you're an artist. You know, press into that. It may be something you need to do in solitude or with others or both. So when life throws us bones, we can slow down and breathe in his presence. Another habit that I found really helpful is simply to express gratitude. It's something that as a family we kind of force ourselves to do every single night. You know, we pray together and we express some of the things that we're grateful for. And I'll be honest, there's been times where I've tried to skip on from that bit for myself and I try and make sure no one notices, but Kathy always notices. And so even when I feel low, it's such a good practice to know what I'm thankful for. Because there's always, always something. If you're struggling right now to think, what can I be grateful for? Think about that breath in your lungs. Think about the last meal that you had or the roof over your head. And I love what Denzel Washington, the the great actor, says. He says, thank God in advance for what's already yours. We thank God in every circumstance. Even when it feels like there is nothing there is always something. And, you know, science tells us that gratitude is life-changing. Um, some scientists, uh, Emmons and McCulloch, they're probably psychologists, actually, um, in, the U- in the U.S., they wrote a paper called Counting Blessings Versus Burdens. They found that gratitude increases quality of sleep by 25%. So if you're not getting 5%, that's pretty good. And the amount of sleep by 8%. And it can also help you exercise more. Um, The University of California created an online gratitude journal and users reported less pain, um, so less pain in the stomach, fewer headaches, reduced blood pressure, and, and a decrease overall in physical symptoms. So gratitude scientifically improves our standard of life. And we, as followers of Jesus, have so much more to be grateful for. To a God who gave us everything, who gave it all, who sent his son to die for us and to give us life. So we find ways to remember and to be grateful for what we have. Even, you know, in the hard times when it can feel like we have nothing to be happy about. You know, happiness is something that comes and goes, but joy and this is the next habit I want to think about, is, is go so much deeper than, than our current circumstances. Henry Nouwen says, joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, can take that love away. Nothing can take his love away from us, just as the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8. And so we choose joy We choose joy because regardless of what life throws at us, 
We are known and we are loved by God. The great theologian, I'm maybe singer, the great singer, Candy Statton, puts it like this. She said, what, oh, she sang, and I'm not going to sing, just to make that very clear. She said, and while you're waiting, start praising. He is going to see you through. Here is what you've got to do. Praise him till your blessings come down. Praise him till your situation turns around. You've got to lift up your voice and say, hallelujah anyway. Hallelujah anyway. That's our cry, isn't it? We raise a hallelujah When we're in the bottom of the valley, when we're at the top of the mountain, we raise a hallelujah. We continue to praise. We choose to be joyful. We choose to keep going in the midst of pain. More than anything, I think there's something incredibly powerful about just keeping on going. When life throws us bones, we keep going. And Satan hates it. I've, I've almost, I've kind of come to this point in my own life where I was like, you can, you can take my mobility, you can take my independence, you could take the health of my kids even, but I'm carrying on. I'm going to keep on going regardless. See, it's not about doing anything glamorous, it's just about showing up. It's about morning by morning opening up the scriptures, praying, worshipping, seeking the Lord day by day choosing to say yes to whatever he has for us. Week by week choosing to serve others, choosing to listen to God for the people in our small group and the people that are set next to us perhaps on a Sunday. In my own life, since all this has happened, I've had so many more opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with the people I meet. Opportunities to pray for people that are also experiencing pain. And I'm a much more patient dad as well, I think. (laughs) I'm looking at Kathy right now. But, you know, we keep on keeping on, not just to get by in life, but to live the life of abundance that Jesus has for us. So what does that mean when we look out the window and we see the state of the world around us? Do Do we just kind of hope for the best? Do we hide behind the curtains and complain about the state of what's going on in our street? Do we trap ourselves in a holy huddle each Sunday and just hope that things will get better? Or do we pull back the curtains? Do we step outside? Do we look around and ask the Lord, what is broken? Do we ask him, Lord, what is breaking your heart? Lord, break me with those things. What dry bones do you see around you as you pull back your curtains? What dry bones do you want the breath of the Lord to breathe upon over the hurt that you see in our communities, over our hurting families, friends, neighbors? The reality is he calls you and me to be the ones to speak life into these dry bones. Son of man, daughter of man, prophesy. We have such a better story to live out and to share with those around us. A story that speaks to those in pain. A story that speaks to those struggling to trust anybody. A story that speaks to all those who can't get off their phones for all those struggling to understand who they are made to be, for those struggling with their broken by the division they see in the church. Son of man, prophesy. Son of man, prophesy. So I want to ask you this morning, what is breaking your heart today? What is it when you look out and you think, so much brokenness? There's so much hurt. There's so much suffering. You know, there's an invitation to each one of us today that wherever we're at, whether we're on a mountaintop or down in the valley, to, first of all, to experience the fullness of God's life for ourselves and then to express that life to the world around us. 